training is absolutely uh, the number one. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact we can do. So that's one example where these silos really need to come together if we're going to take this further forward. John uh, got together about 40 people to come up with the challenges document. Levels of inflammatory proteins like TNF being really high that we would treat with medication. There was one well done study in Europe where they didn't just ask patients because it's difficult to say when you're stressed and when you're not, especially in hindsight. So there's solid biologic evidence that stress can uh, sort of get you close to the threshold. What about sleep? How does that feed into number one, stress, and number two, uh, is there an independent sleep meter that we need to have uh, for our IBD. So any takers there? I mean, the, 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 the only thing I would add, which I know, is that there have been plenty of studies that have looked at sleep and depression on effects on the immune system. And so it, clearly those things have effects on the immune system. And we know with inflammatory bowel disease that the immune system um, or an inappropriate immune system or a not functioning immune system um, is related to the disease. So there's real good reason to suspect that uh, um, stress and, and lack of sleep would ha does have effects on the immune system and that would lead or contribute to IBD. But as far as specific studies, that's not what I yeah. do, so I don't I, know. I, I could make a comment and that is that just the inflammatory mediators with tumor necrosis factor, TNF being an obvious one, can affect brain function and particularly alertness and the need for sleep. So one of the body's physiologic adaptation to infection and inflammation <coughs> is to go into a uh, mode of uh, conserving energy and sleeping. So if you infuse TNF into mice, they, they get, they, they, they um, uh, kind of huddle in a corner and don't move and get sleepy. And one of the effects when you infuse uh, Remicade or Humira or Simsia is that people very rapidly feel better. And that's probably that decreasing that inflammatory mediator effect. Uh, and then there, there's, there are effects, uh, there are studies going on on circadian rhythm and the so-called diurnal variation, where your own steroid production, for example, peaks early in the morning and then fades out during the day. And sleep patterns very much affect these circadian rhythms. And we, the CCFA has actually, I think, got a grant application and is funding uh, someone in University of Michigan to look at these circadian rhythms. Might be NIH. Uh, I get confused with all the grants I look at. So, but at least there is a study going on in IBD models looking at this circadian rhythm. And, and Belfer, let's not forget that um, if this is true, and I, 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 I believe that stress does have an effect, I, I find the biological arguments that have, John was talking about compelling. Um, not, notwithstanding what my patients tell me. But if sleep is really important, let's not forget that when our patients are unwell, their sleep rhythm is completely disrupted right. with abdominal pain and up all night in the, in the restroom. And, and particularly if you should throw steroids in the mix. Exactly, okay. I was hoping we weren't <laughs> gonna go, go back, back to there. that. But, uh, let's go back down that But road. yes, so, we, so we're actually getting into a cycle <laughs> where we're um, not talking a cycle about steroids, but a cycle about where the sleep is is disrupted, it's making things worse, perhaps from an immune point of view, exacerbating the disease and so on and so on. So. Yeah, so Ted, you specifically brought up, when you see a patient, you ask about depression, you ask about stress factors. So how do you, first of all, why do you do that? And secondly, how do you act on it? Well, we, and we use some screening tools that have been developed for kids um, that, are, that are pretty accurate as far as sorting that out, so they actually fill that out with their parents while they're waiting to be seen, and then we see that before we go in the room. Um, it's because sometimes some of the symptoms can really overlap between having trouble sleeping and being really tired. 
could either be from levels of inflammatory proteins like TNF being really high that we would treat with medication, or the inflammation is actually controlled and, um, and the patient is, is depressed or very anxious and that's what's causing their symptoms. Now there's a lot of overlap between these things and a, there's a pediatric psychologist, Laura Mackner, um, up the road from me in Columbus in Ohio, which is a, who's actually doing a clinical trial now of cognitive behavioral therapy in kids with IBD in remission. And they're measuring some of these stress hormones and cytokines. Um, only preliminary results so far, but what they're testing is that, as John mentioned, actually providing cognitive behavioral therapy targeting stress and depression will lower inflammatory mediators without any change in medication and lead to better outcomes. So if you have people with a similar genetic makeup, why is it that some, what, some of those individuals are developing inflammatory bowel disease, others are developing other autoimmune disease, and others remain well? What is the environmental trigger that comes along uh, and triggers uh, the, uh, the gut inflammation in certain individuals? Okay, so let's take that. So practically speaking, many people in the audience have one child with IBD, mm -hmm. Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and they're worried about their other children or yet to be born children. So what risk factors practically could we, might we impl implicate in developing disease in a genetically susceptible host? Okay. So the way I answer that question, the risk is uh, if you have uh, um, an individual with, say, Crohn's disease, what is the chance of a sibling of that individual getting Crohn's disease? The risk is about 10%. The way I answer that is I say there's a 90% chance they're not going to get Crohn's disease. And I think it's very important to, to, to put that in that terms. However, what can we do to intervene? Um, at the moment, we don't have a lot of intervention, but there are some practical things that I think are worth discussing. I emphasize the association between smoking and Crohn's disease, and I, I say that it's imperative that those individuals at risk of Crohn's disease do not smoke, and they're given the appropriate education about that. And that doesn't just mean that individual, it means people within that household. So there's yes. no childhood exposure to smoke um, because parents are smoking in the house and so on. I think that's important. Smoking is absolutely uh, the number one. Uh, that's probably the biggest impact we can do. It also helps you, but that's only with Crohn's disease because there's a reverse effect, and I hate to mention it, uh, with ulcerative colitis. Uh, statistically, uh, smoking is actually protective in ulcerative colitis. Um, that but was not in, taped. In, in Crohn's disease, <laughs> I am not advocating smoking if you have ulcerative colitis. Uh, uh, but why, excuse me, smoking? What's the correlation? Well, we don't, we don't understand. We don't know whether it's nicotine. It's probably not as simple as nicotine. It's, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, Scott Plevy, has been looking at carbon monoxide as an inducer of protective uh, um, uh, heme oxygenase, which is a protective pathway. Um, you know, we just don't know. There's so, cigarette smoking is so complex, we don't know. But cigarette smoking is a big risk factor for Crohn's. Taking aspirin, Motrin, ibuprofen, is another thing, if you remember that Venn diagram, those four <coughs> things I, I mentioned last night under environmental triggers, taking aspirin, Motrin, um, can break the mucosal barrier and activate responses and decrease protection. Uh, diet probably does have an impact. We don't know, we're gonna get into diet in just a second. Um, stress um, and infections and probably antibiotics. All of those things can trigger an event that then leads in a genetically susceptible host to uh, inflammation that is then sustained.